Doopity doop. Sending a signal. Is a signal being sent? Sending a signal. Is a signal being sent? Maybe. Checking the sound. Oh, my sound's off. That would explain why. Cool. Well, it looks like it works now. Hello, everyone. It is. Oh, it was a long weekend this weekend, so I don't even know what it is anymore. It is Thursday, February, some day in February. Uh, welcome to a late evening, regular time, wrong day of Shaggy Reads live. Continuing our me going through books on my shelf that are British for this month until I run out. We're reading a Neil Gaiman book. This is, with a split screen, Neil Gaiman's Trigger Warnings is a collection of short stories of, as it says there, fictions and distractions. Now, why do I have this book, you, you ask? Um, because, you know, I, I actually, uh, I do once in a long blue moon read a book for uh, my own enjoyment and entertainment. Uh, and uh, Neil Gaiman's Coraline is one of the first books that I read on my own without it being, like, assigned to me or have to do it for something. I just kind of did it for fun. And it, it was so engaging and so gripping. And I just read the whole thing in one night by candlelight out in the countryside. Uh, and there was like a, <laughs> my, my own little short story of while reading this eerie story was, in, it was in the darkness out in the night in cottage country. And while I was reading Neil Gaiman's, uh, Coraline by Candlelight, I saw something in the distance waving at me, something in the bushes, in the shadows, like this white blur waving back and forth at me like that. And I'm like, what the hell is, is that a peacock? What the hell is that? It's like almost midnight. And it turns out it was a skunk. Uh, and it came all trotting right towards me all happily. And I just froze. And it went under my table, almost through my legs, like just under my tail, past my leg, and then into the backyard. And I was just staying still. And it was like a happy little skunk just on an adventure. And uh, and from then on, I've been in love with Neil Gaiman's writing. No, that's not the story. Uh, the point is, so why do I have this book, though? Because uh, beyond that, I haven't really read too much of his other things, uh, even though I, I generally kind of enjoy what he does. Um, uh, this one was, I forget which airport I was at, but I wanted like that true travel airport feeling. When you buy a book from the airport and then you read said book on an airplane. And this was the only one from an author that I knew uh, by name because everything is all this like, you know, gripping thrillers. And I'm like, who's, whose thriller is this? Who's gripping? I don't know. I don't want these books. But then I saw a Neil Gaiman book. I'm like, okay, check it out. Uh, so this is a collection of short stories. I believe it came out in 2015. And despite the name, I, it's, I, I don't think the name is terribly accurate to like everything in the content of the book. Because there's one thing he said uh, where he was saying like, for the most part anthologies and collections are usually like short stories that are meant to be put together for a reason but apparently this one was just short stories he had lying around he just put them on one book and gave it the name um so i don't think uh, there's anything to be concerned about with the title i don't think there's anything um that can you know, cause said title trigger warning so i think we should all be all right but if not i apologize in advance um yeah so let's take a quick look at this and we'll debate if i should read in my neil game and voice <laughs> Because <laughs> I've only done it once during the very first uh, Shaggy Reads uh, run. And it's not a very good impression. But maybe I'll just do it for his sh first short story. Making a Chair. But the only way I can get his voice is if I start with, Hello! I'm, ne I'm Neil Gaiman. Hello! I think that's his voice. Hello! It's a little deeper. Hello! I'm Neil Gaiman. <laughs> That's not what it is, but let's give it a go for this one. Other stories have other characters in it. Um, I think this is just like a short poem. Today, today, hello, I'm Neil Gaiman. <laughs> We're never going to get through this. I apologize in advance. Today I intend to begin to write. Stories are waiting like distant thunderstorms, grumbling and flickering in the gray horizon. And there are emails and introductions and a book, a whole damn book, about a country. Hello, I'm Neil Gaiman. I think that's his voice. <laughs> I'm sorry, Neil. <laughs> you're, so, you're such a better writer than me, and this is what I do to you. <laughs> and a country and a journey and belief. I'm here to write. I made a chair. I opened a cud... <laughs> I'm tripping over my own voice doing this. I opened a cardboard box with a blade. I assembled the blade, removed the parts, carried them carefully up the stairs. Functional seating for today's workplace. I preserved five casters into a base. Le le learned that they press in well with most satisfying pop. Attached an armrest with the screws. Puzzling over the left and the right of it. 
I'm like dangerously on the edge of a knife of falling into Kermit territory, so I gotta be very careful. <laughs> the screws not being what they should be, as described in the instructions. And then the base beneath the seat, which attached to the 640mm screws that were puzzling 645mm screws. Then the headpiece of the chair back. The chair back to the seat, which is where the problems start. In the middle, screw on either side declines to penetrate the thread. This all takes time. Orson Welles is Harry Lime on an old radio, and I assemble my chair. Orson meets a dame and a crooked fortune teller and a fat man and a New York gang boss in exile. And has slept with the dame, solved the mystery, read the script, and pocketed the money before I assembled my chair. Making a book is a little like making a chair. Perhaps it ought to come with warnings, like the chair instructions. A folded piece of paper slipped into each copy, warning us only for one person at a time. Do not use as a stool or a stepladder. Failure to follow these warnings can result in serious injury. One day I will write another book, and when I am done I will climb it and stroll stool or stepladder, or a high old wooden ladder propped against the side of a plum tree in the autumn, and I will be gone. But for now, I shall follow these warnings and finish making the chair. Cool, that was Neil Gaiman reading, making a chair, <laughs> and trigger warning. Okay, so this one is more of a narrative and has some characters. And this also has, like, far as I've actually read the first time when I uh, purchased this book. I got to the second story and was baffled by the end, if I recall correctly, and had to, like, do some research because it had some deeper lore and cultural relevance that I personally do not have within my knowledge. So I was confused, but maybe you, dear listener at home, won't be. But we can do some voices for this one. I'll do some standard ones. But if you guys have any character voices you want me to attempt down the road for some of the other stories, if we make to them within the hour, I'll give it my dang diggity best. But we'll kick off with A Lunar Labyrinth. We were walking up a gentle hill on the summer's evening. It was gone 8.30, but it still felt like mid-afternoon. The sky was blue. The sun was low on the horizon, and it splashed the clouds with gold and salmon and purple-gray. So how did it end? I asked my guide. It never ends, he said. But you said it's gone, I said. The maze. I had found the Lunar Labyrinth mentioned online, a small footnote on a website that told you what was interesting and noteworthy wherever you were in the world. Unusual local attractions, the tackier and more man-made, the better. I do not know why I'm drawn to them. Stoneless henge made of cars or a yellow school bus, polystern models of enormous blocks of cheese, unconvincing dinosaurs made of flaking powdery concrete, and all the rest. I need them, and they give me an excuse to stop driving, wherever I am, and actually to talk to people. I have been invited to people's houses and into their lives because I wholeheartedly appreciated the zoos they made from engine parts, the houses that they built from tin cans, stone blocks, and then covered them on aluminum foil, the historical pageants made from shop window dummies, the paint on their faces flaking off, and those people, the ones who made the roadside attractions, they would accept me for what I am. We burned it down, said my guide. He was elderly, and he walked with a stick. I had met him sitting on a bench in front of the town's hardware store, and he had agreed to show me the site of the Lunar Labyrinth had once been built upon. Our progress across the meadow was not fast. The end of the Lunar Labyrinth. It was easy. The rosemary hedges caught fire and crackled and flared. The smoke was thick and drifted down the hill and made us all think of roast lamb. Why was it called a Lunar Labyrinth? I asked. Was it just the uh, alteration? Or alliteration, if that's a better word, that was actually written? He thought about this. I wouldn't rightly know, he said. Not one way or the other. We called it the We called it a labyrinth, and I guess it's just a maze. Just amazed, I repeated. There were traditions, he said. We would start to walk in the day after noon. Boop, beep. I usually say beep when I need to do an edit in audio recording, so beep. <laughs> day after the full moon. Begin at the entrance, make your way to the center, and turn around and trace your way back. Like I say, we'd only start walking the day the moon began to wane. It would still be bright enough to walk. We'd walk in at ni any night the moon was bright enough to see by. Come out here. Walk, mostly in couples. We walk until the dark of the moon. 
Nobody walked in the dark? Oh, some of them did. But they weren't like us. They were kids, and they brought flashlights. Then the moon went dark. They walked it. The bad kids, the bad seeds, the one who wanted to scare each. I'm assuming it's going to say, oh, they're on the next page. Oh, they're... For those kids, it was Halloween every month. They loved to be scared. Let's check if my level's all right. <laughs> Some of them said they saw a torturer. What, what kind of torturer? The word had surprised me. You did not hear it often, not in conversation. Just someone who tortured people, I guess. I never saw him. A breeze came down towards us from the hilltop. I sniffed the air, but smelled no burning herbs, no ash. Nothing that seemed unusual in a summer's evening. Somewhere, there were gardeners. It was only kids then when the moon was dark. When the crescent moon appeared then the children got younger, the parents would come up to the hill and walk with them. Parents and children. They'd walk the maze together to its center, and the adults would point up at the new moon, how it looks like a smile in the sky, a huge yellow smile with little Romulus and Remus, or whoever the kids were called. They'd smile and laugh and wave their hands as if they were trying to pull the moon out of the sky and put it on their little faces. Then as the moon wick waxed, 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 the couples would come, young couples would come up here courting, and elderly couples comfortable in each other's company, and ones whose courting days were long forgotten. He leaned heavily on his stick. Not forgotten, he said. You never forget. It must be somewhere inside you. Even in the brain has forgotten perhaps the teeth remember or the fingers. Did they have flashlights? It's interesting it says flashlights, though. Is this guy American? Because it would have been a torch if it was British. Maybe. Some nights they did. Some nights they didn't. The popular nights were always the nights when no clouds cover the moon and you could just walk the labyrinth. And sooner or later, everybody did, as the moonlight increased day by day, night by night, I should say. The world was so beautiful. They parked their cars down there, back where you parked yours, at the edge of the property. And they came up the hill on foot, always on foot, except for the ones in wheelchairs or the ones whose parents carried them. Then at the top of the hill, some of them stopped to canoodle. They'd walk to the labyrinth, too. There were benches, places to stop as you walk in, and they'd stop and canoodle some more. You'd think it was just young ones canoodling, but the older folks did it too. Flesh to flesh. Thanks. <laughs> you wouldn't hear them sometimes on the other side of the edge, making noises like animals. No, you would hear them, I guess. And that always was your cue to slow down or maybe explore another bench or the path for a while. It doesn't come by too often, but when it does, I think I appreciate it more now than it did then. Lips touching skin under the moonlight. Thanks, sir. How many years exactly was the Lunar Labyrinth here before it was burned down? Did it come before or after the house was built? My guide made a dismissive noise. After, before, these things all go back. They talk about the Labyrinth of Minos, but that was nothing by compared to this. Just some tunnels with a horn-headed fellow wandering lonely and scared and hungry. He wasn't really a bullhead, you know that. How do you know? Teeth. Bulls and cows are, are remnants. Rem, rem, remnants. Remnants. They don't eat flesh. The Minotaur did. I hadn't thought of that. People don't. The hill was getting steeper now. I thought, there are no torturers, no any longer. Not any longer. And it was, yeah, and I was no torturer. Okay, but I still don't appreciate when words get split at the end of a page and put onto the other page. It's really hard to read. Let's just, let's just, let's just press that enter button, why don't we? Let's just indent that bad boy. But all I said was, uh, how high were the bushes that made up the maze? Were they real hedges? Oh, they were real. They were high as they needed to be. I didn't know how high rosemaries grew in these parts. I didn't. I was far from home. <sighs> we have gentle winters. Rosemaries flourish here. So why exactly did the people burn it all down? He paused. You'll get a better idea of how things lie when you get up to the top of the hill. How they lie? At the top of the hill. The hill was getting steeper and steeper. My left knee had been injured to previous winter and a fall on the ice, which meant I could no longer run fast, and these days I found hills and steep extremely taxing. With each step, my knee would twinge, reminding me angrily of its existence. Many people, on, leaning that, on learning that the local oddity they wished to visit had burned down some years before, would simply have gotten back into their cars and driven on towards their final destination. I'm not so easily deterred. The finest things I have seen are dead places. A shattered amusement, shuttered amusement park I entered by bribing a night watchman with a price of a drink. An abandoned barn in which the farmer said half a dozen Bigfoots had been living the summer before. 
He said they howled at night and that they stank, but that they had moved on almost a year ago. There was a rank animal smell that lingered in that place, and it might have been coyotes. When the moon waned, they walked to the Lona Labyrinth with love, said my guide. But it waxed, and they walked with desire, not with love. Do I have to explain the difference to you? The sheep and the goats? I don't think so. The sick came too, sometimes. The damaged and the disabled came. And some of them needed to be wheeled through the labyrinth or carried. But even they had to choose the path they traveled, not the people carrying them or wheeling them. Nobody chose their paths but them. When I was a boy, people called them cripples. I'm glad we don't call them cripples any longer. The lovelorn came too. The lone... The lunatics, they were brought here sometimes. Got their name from the moon. It was only fair the moon had a chance to fix things. We were approaching the top of the hill. It was dusk. The sky was the color of wine now, and the clouds and the west glowed with the light of the setting sun, although from there, from where we were standing, it had already dropped below the horizon. You'll see when we get up there. It's perfectly flat at the top of the hill. I wanted to contribute something, so I said, Where I come from five hundred years ago, the local lord was visiting the king, and the king showed off his enormous table, his candles, his beautiful painted ceiling, and as each one was displayed, instead of praising it, the lord simply said, I have a finer and bigger and better one. The king wanted to call his bluff and told him that the following month he would come and eat his, this table bigger and finer than the king's lit by candles and candle holders bigger and finer than the king's, under a ceiling painting bigger and better than the king's. My guide said, Did he lay out a tablecloth on the flatness of the hill and have twenty brave men holding candles? And did they dine beneath God's own star? Did the boss have him imprisoned and tortured? Asked my guide. That's what happened in the version of the story they tell hereabouts. They say that the man never even made it as far as the Cordon du Bleu desert. Desert. His chef had whipped up. They found him on the following day with his hands cut off, his severed tongue placed neatly in the breast pocket, and finally a bullet hole in the forehead. Here? On the house back there? Good lord, no. They left his body on the nightclub over in the city. I was surprised how quickly dusk had ended. There was still a glow in the west, but the rest of the sky had become night, plum purple in its majesty. Uh, this is him talking. The days before the fall of the moon in the labyrinth, he said, they were set aside with the, uh, for the infirm and those in need. My sister had a woman's condition. They told her it would be fatal if she didn't have her insides all scraped out, and then it might be fatal anyway. Her stomach had swollen up, as if she was car and if she was carrying a baby, not a tumor, although she must have been puff pushing 50. She came up when the moon was a day from full, and she walked the labyrinth, walked it from the outside in the moon's light. And she walked it from the center back to the outside with no false steps or mistakes. What happened to her? She lived, he said shortly. We crested the hill, but I could not see what I was looking at. It was too dark. They delivered her of the, of the thing inside her. It lived as well for a while, he paused. Then he tapped my arm. Look over there. I turned and looked. The size of the moon astonished me. I know it's an optical illusion that the moon grows no smaller as it rises, but uh, yeah, it grows no smaller as it rises. But the moon seemed to take up so much of the horizon as it rose that I found myself thinking of the old Frank Fredzetta paperback covers, where men with their swords raised would be silhouetted in front of the huge moons. As I remembered paintings of wolves hallowing on high tops, black cutouts against the circle of snow white moon that framed them. The enormous moon that was rising was a creamy yellow of freshly churned butter. Is the moon full? I asked. That's a full moon, all right. He sounded satisfied. And there's the labyrinth. We walked towards it. I had expected to see ash on the ground or nothing. Instead, on the buttery moonlight, I saw a maze, complex and elegant, made of circles and whorls inside of a huge square. I could not judge distance properly in that light, but I thought that each side of the square must be 200 feet or more. The plants that outlined the maze were low to the ground, though none of them were more than a foot tall. I bent down, picked a needling like leaf, black in the moonlight, and crushed it between finger and thumb. I inhaled and thought of raw lamb, carefully dismembered, then prepared and placed in an oven on a bed of branches and needles that smelled just like this. I thought you people burned this to the ground, I said. We did. They ain't hedges, not any longer. But things grow again in this season. There's no killing some things. Rosemary's tough. Where's the entrance? You're standing in it, he said. 
He was an old man who walked with a stick and talked to strangers. Nobody would ever miss him. <laughs> so what happened up here when the moon was full? Locals didn't walk the labyrinth then. That was when one night that paid for all. That was the one night that paid for all. I took a step into the maze. There was nothing difficult about it, not with the bushes that marked it no higher than my shins, no higher than a kitchen garden. If I got lost, I could simply step over the bushes or walk back out. But for now, I followed the path into the labyrinth. It was easy to make out the light of the full moon. I could hear my guide, so we continued to talk. Some folk thought even the price was too high. That was why we came up here, why we burned the lunar labyrinth. We came up that hill when the moon was dark, and we carried burning torches like the old black-and-white movies. We all did. Even me. But you can't kill everything. It doesn't work like that. Why Rosemary? I asked. Rosemary's for remembering, he told me. The butter yellow moon was rising faster than I imagined or expected. Now it was a pale ghost face in the sky, calm and compassionate. Its colors was white bone white. The man said, There's always a chance that you can get out safely, even in the night of a full moon. First you have to get to the center of the labyrinth. There's a fountain there. You'll see. You can't mistake it. Then you have to make it back from the center. No missteps, no dead ends, no mistakes on the way in or on the way out. It's probably easier now than it was when the bushes were high. It's a chance. Otherwise, the labyrinth, labyrinth gets to cure you of all that ails you. Of course, you'll have to run. I looked back. I could not see my guide, not any longer. There was something in front of me, beyond the bush path pattern, a black shadow padding silently along the perimeter of the square. It was the size of a large dog, but it did not move like a dog. It threw back its head and howled to the moon with amusement and with merriment. A huge flat table at the top of the hill echoed with joyous howls, and my left knee aching from the long hill climb, I stumbled forward. The maze had a pattern. I could trace it. Above me the moon shone brightest day. She had always accepted my gifts in the past. She would not pay me false at the end. Run, said a voice that was almost a growl. I ran like a lamb to his laughter. And that was the Lunar Labyrinth. Okay, so maybe my memory of this was wrong, because I thought I was confused at the end for one reason, but I think I was confused at the end for another reason. I was just like, oh, he was the werewolf, oh, look. <laughs> How's about that? Or maybe there's something more to it. And then that's why I looked into and got confused. And that's when I didn't read much further, because then I was not on an airplane anymore. But that's all good. Sometimes you got to have a Lunar Labyrinth. But we can now move on to a story that I actually have not read yet. Uh, let's check our time quickly, too. It is 8.22, plenty of time for story time. This is The Thing About Cassandra. Uh, so now we're entering uncharted territories, and this is where I get concerned that if I pull out my silly voices and then the story becomes a serious, is that just in poor taste? But now that we're doing the Southern Bell voice, and we said the name Cassandra... Well, let's just delve right into this, why don't we? So this... <laughs> I, I hate when I'm about to start something, I get tripped up on a word. Scaly? It's a person's name. So this Scaly and me, wearing Starsky and Hutch wigs. I don't know if this person's a Southern Belle, but let's just give it a go. Complete with sideburns, and five o'clock in the morning by the side of the canal in Amsterdam. <laughs> that bit... <laughs> That's not a good narrator voice, is it? <laughs> There had been ten of us that night, including Rob, the groom, last seen handcuffed to the bed in the red light district, and Patton, the hooker, holding the straight razor on the arse. Damn, Neil. We certainly twisted and turned on our story theme out of nowhere. Any hoozle, let's keep delving in. <laughs> okay, where was I? All these giggles have gotten me confused. Which was the point I looked at Scaly, and he looked at me and said, Maxim deniability. And I nodded, because there was some questions you don't want to be able to answer when a bride starts asking pointed questions with a stag weekend. So we slipped off to drink, leaving eight men in Starsky and Hutchwigs, one of whom was mostly naked, attached to a bed by fluffy pink handcuffs, and seemed to be starting to think that this adventure wasn't such a good idea after all. Behind us. That was like a sub-thought, parentheses. In a room that smelled of disinfectant and cheap incense. 
and we went and sat by the canal and drank cans of Danish lager and talked about the old days. At this point, this probably isn't this character at all, but hey, Neil hasn't told me the contrary. Scaly, whose real name was Jeremy Porter, and these days people call him Jeremy, but he had been Scaly when we were 11, and the groom-to-be, Rob Cunningham, had been at school with me. We were drifting out of touch, more or less, and found each other the lazy way you do these days through Friends Reunited and Facebook and such. And now Scaly and I were together for the first time since we were 19. The Stowski and Hutchwigs, which had been Scaly's idea, made us look like we were playing brothers in some made-for-TV movie. Scaly, the short, stocky brother with the thick mustache. Me, the tall one. Given that I made a significant part of my income since leaving school modeling, I'd add the tall, good-looks one, but nobody looks good in a Stowski and Hutch wig complete with sideburns. Also, the wig itched. We sat by the canal, and when the lager had all gone, we kept talking and watched the sun come up. Last time I saw Scaly was 19, and filled with big plans. He had just joined the RAF as a cadet, and was going to fly planes and do double duty, using the flights to smuggle drugs and get incredibly rich while helping his country. It was the kind of mad idea he used to have all the way through school. Usually the whole thing would fall apart. Sometimes he'd get the rest of us into trouble on the way. Now, twelve years later, his six months in the RAF ended early because of an unspecified problem with his ankle. Huh. Now we're getting a theme. <laughs> Ankles. He was a senior executive in a firm that manufactured double glazed windows and told me with a sincere wait with up with it but whoop rewind he told me with since the divorce a smaller house than he felt that he deserved and only a golden retriever for company he was sleeping with the woman in the double glazed firm but had no expectations of her leaving her boyfriend for him seemed to find it easier that way all right, who's talking? Is that him talking? Uh, we need another voice now. I can't do Southern Bell for everybody. <laughs> Wait, I'll tell you what. All right, Southern gentleman, Colonel Sanders. Of course, I'll tell you what. I wake up crying sometimes. Oh, man, I'm sorry. Since the divorce, I'll tell you what. Well, you do. Well, you do. He said at one point, I could not imagine him crying. And anyway, he said it was a huge, scaly grin. Whoa, that was scaly. Okay, so scaly's Colonel Saunders. I told him about me, still modeling, helping win out in a friend's antique shop to keep busy. More and more paintings and stuff. I was lucky. People bought my paintings. Every year would have a small gallery show at the Little Gallery in Chelsea. Ooh, I've been to Chelsea. Oh, so this guy's actually from New York then. Unless it's like England, Chelsea. <laughs> Chelsea. No, it's not even a British accent. <laughs> uh, we got Black Sheep saying, I thought Neil Gaiman was just Southern lol. No, I, I think he's pretty British. <laughs> I think he's fairly British. This is just me, little old me being a goofster. <laughs> uh, maybe it's just because I watched too many like Resident Evil 7 videos lately. Welcome to the family. Anyway, uh, every year would have a small gallery show at the Little Gallery in Chelsea. Ah, oh, Chelsea. That's where Sleep No More is. If you haven't seen it yet, get yourself into some immersive theater. Start off with Sleep No More. Oh my gosh, we'll change your life. Been to New York like six times now because of that show. Anyway, neither here nor there. That was a distraction. We walked about the day, talked, another word, anyway... We talked about the days that only Scaly seemed to remember when he and Rob and I had been on a team of three. Involable. Invoil invoil inviolable. That's a word I don't know if I've ever run into. Inviolable. Unbreakable. We talked about the teenage heartbreak, about Coraline, uh mm -hmm, Neil, sneaking in references to other books, Neil. Coraline Minton who was now Coraline Keen and married to a vicar. Hmm. About the first time we brazened our way into an 18 film. <laughs> or rated R here in Canada. 
although neither of us could remember what the film actually was. Then Scaly said, I I'll tell you what I heard from Cassandra the other day. Cassandra? Your old, wait, oh, your old girlfriend, I'll tell you what. Cassandra, remember? No. The one from Rigget? You had her name written on you with your books. I must, uh, I must have looked particularly dense or drunk or sleepy, because he said, You must have met her on a skiing holiday. Oh, for heaven's sake. Your first shag, Cassandra. Oh, I said, remembering. Community Theater in East London. Or maybe it is Chelsea, London, not Chelsea, New York. Well, go to London, because there's also immersive theater there. Right now there's some, like, boxing show where all the boxers and crowds are actually actors. And you're like, what? Anyway, I imagine that's the review. <laughs> uh, you should talk to her. Really? I think, well, I mean, I tell you what, reading between the lines of her message, she may still have a thing for you. She asked after you. I wondered... How drunk he was, how drunk I was, staring at the canal in the early light. I said something, I forgot what. Then I asked whether Scaly remembered where our hotel was, because I had forgotten, and he said he had forgotten too, and that Rob had all the hotel details, and really we should go and find him, and rescue him from the clutches of the nice hooker with the handcuffs, and the shaving kit, which we realized would be easier if we knew how to get back to where we left him, and looking for some clue to where we had left Rob, I found a card, why is this still one sentence, with the hotel's address on the back pocket, so we headed back there, and the last thing I did before I walked away from the canal was that whole strange evening, was the put it Neil, that's the easy periods in your commons, com commas, man. It hurts me, Neil. <clears throat> it floated. If you didn't catch it, I think something went in the canal, the wig. <laughs> Scaly said, There was a deposit on that, you know. If we don't want to wear it, I'd have carried it. Then he said, You should have tell you what should have dropped Cassandra line. I shook my head. I wondered who he had been talking to online, who he had confused for her. Knowing it definitely wasn't Cassandra. The thing about Cassandra is this. I made her up. Oh, shoot. This is like one of them creepy stories where it's like, yeah, I got a girl and she's a ballerina person. And then five minutes later on the phone is a ballerina person. It's like a Goosebumps book. <laughs> Flashback, I was 15, almost 16. I was awkward. I had just experienced my teenage growth spurt and was suddenly taller than most of my friends, self-conscious about my height. My mother owned and ran a small ride in stables. And I, oh, see, yes, this is a southern bell for stables involved. And I helped out there, but the girls, competent, horsey, sensible types, intimidated me. At home, I wrote bad poetry and painted watercolors, mostly of ponies and fields. At school, there were only boys at my school. I played cricket competently, acted a little, hung around with my friends playing records. The CD was newly around, but CD players were expensive and rare, and we had all inherited record players and hi-fis from parents or older siblings. If only you knew, the record is back better than ever and the CD's dead. The cassette is coming back. People love the mixtapes. When we didn't talk about music or sports, we talked about girls. Scaly was older than me. So was Rob. They liked having me as part of the gang, but they liked teasing me too. They acted like I was a kid, and I wasn't. They had done, both done it, it you know what it is, with girls. Actually, that's not entirely true. They had both done it with the same girl, Coraline Minton famously free with her favors, and always up for it once, as long as the person she was with had a moped. I thought it had mopped. I'm like, damn, you mopped that floor real good. <laughs> I did not have a moped. I was not old enough to get one. You had horses! Yeah, well, my mother could not afford one. My father had died when I was small of an accidental overdose of anesthetic when he was in the hospital to have a minor operation of an infected toe. To this day, I avoid hospitals. 
I had seen Coraline mint on at parties, but she terrified me, and even had I owned a moped, I would not have wanted my first sexual experience to be with her. I wonder if people actually talk like this. <laughs> like, forever. Because it's, it's difficult. <laughs> Scaly and Rob had girlfriends. Scaly's girlfriend was taller than he was, had huge breasts, and was interested in football. Which meant Scaly had to feign an injury in football. Mostly, Crystal Palace, with Rob's girlfriend, thought that Rob and she had things in common. Which meant that Rob stopped listening to the mid-90s electropop to the rest of us liked and started listening to the hippie bands. From before we were born, which was bad. And that Rob got to raid her dad's amazing collection of old TV on video, which was good. I had no girlfriend. Even my mother began to comment on it. There must have been a place where it came from. The name, the idea. I don't remember, though. I just remembered writing Cassandra on my exercise books. Then, carefully, not saying anything. Now, is this young... Okay, this is young... Young Colonel Sanders. I, I tell you, what, who chose Cassandra? Asked Scaly on the bus to school. Nobody, I said. Uh, she, she, she must be somebody. You, you, I tell you what, you wrote her name on the maths exercise book. She's just a girl I met on the skiing holiday. My mother and I had gone skiing with my aunt and cousin the month before in Australia. Really? I guess Australia must have, like, somewhere you can ski. I'll have to ask my Australian friends. I tell you, I tell you, how, how, how are we going to meet her? She's from Rigget. I probably read that wrong. R-E-I-G-A-T-E. Rigget, 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 Rigget. I expect so eventually. <laughs> well, well, I tell you what, I hope so. Man, you like her? <laughs> I paused for what I hoped was the right amount of time and said, She's a real good guesser. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, this is horrible on your ears. I apologize. Then Scaly laughed, and Rob wanted to know if it was a French kiss with tongues and everything, and I said, What do you think? And by the end of the day, we both believed in her. My mom was pleased to hear I'd met somebody. Her questions, what Cassandra's parents did, for example, I simply shrugged away. I went on three dates with Cassandra. On each of our dates, I took the train up to London. Okay, so this is based in England. Gotcha. And took myself to the cinema. It was exciting in its own way. I returned from my first trip with more stories of kissing and a breast feeling. Yeah, Lister Square. Was, as I told my mom, merely spent holding hands together and what was she still called? The pictures. But as reluctantly revealed to Rob and Scaly and over the week to several other school friends who had heard rumors from sworn to secrecy, Rob and Scaly and now need now and and now needed to find out if any of it were true, and still parentheses, or comma within brackets. I don't know. It was actually the day I lost my virginity to Cassandra's aunt's flat in London. In okay, not to in. Mm. The aunt was away. <laughs> Cassandra had a key. I had for proof. A packet of three condemns missing the one I had thrown away and a strip of four black and white photographs I had found on my first trip to London, abandoned in the basket of photo booth in Victoria Station. The photo strip show, strip, strip, strip showed, wait, the photo strip showed of a girl about my age with long straight hair. I could not be certain of the color. Okay, if I just mumbled over everything. Basically, he got a photo of a random girl from a basket at a photo booth. And if photo booths don't exist in this day and age where you are, it's literally a box you went into and pressed the button and you had four chances to look awesome. And then you brought it home and put it on the fridge. Uh, dark blonde, red, light brown, and a friendly, freckly, not unpretty face. I pocketed it. In art class, I did a pencil sketch of the third of the pictures, and one I liked the best. Her head half turned as if calling out to an unseen friend beyond the tiny curtain. She looked sweet and charming. I would have liked her to be my girlfriend. I put the drawing up on my bedroom wall. Oh, we got something's going on. Uh, black sheep said Australia has ski slopes, or do they mean New Zealand? Eh? 
Well, actually, he posted this. Is this a time travel story? No, it's just a flashback to when our lead character, the Southern Belle voiced character, uh, invented a girl who apparently does exist. Which will be the twist. <laughs> Probably. After our third date, it was to see who framed old Roger Rabbit. I came back to school with bad news. Cassandra's family was going to Canada. Finally! Finally, someone acknowledges we exist. A place that sounded more convincing to my ears than America. Something to do with her father's job. And I would not see her for a long time. We hadn't really broken up, but we were being practical. Those were the days when transatlantic phone calls were too expensive for teenagers. It was over. I was sad. Everyone noticed how sad I was. They said they would have loved to have met her, and maybe when she came back at Christmas. I was confident that by Christmas she would be forgotten. She was. By Christmas I was going out with Nikki Blevins, and the only evidence that Cassandra had ever been a part of my life was a name written on a couple of my exercise books and the pencil drawing of her on my bedroom wall with Cassandra, February 19th, 1985, when I was born, <laughs> written underneath it. If it's a time travel story, I just came into the picture. I just showed up. <laughs> when my mother sold the riding stable, the drawing was lost in the move. I was at art college at the time, considering my old pencil drawings and embarrassing as the fact as I had once invented a girlfriend and did not care. I did not believe I had thought of Cassandra for twenty years. My mother sold the stables, the attached house at the meadows, to the property developer who built a housing estate where we had once lived, and as part of the deal, gave him a small detached house at the end of Satan Close. I visit her at least once a fortnight, arriving on Friday night, leaving Sunday morning a routine as regular as the grandmother clock in the hall. Mother is concerned that if I black, mother is concerned that I am happy in life. She has started to mention the various, that various of her friends have eligible daughters. This trip had been an extremely embarrassing conversation that began with her asking if I would like her to introduce me to the organist at her church, a very nice young man about my age. Mother, I'm not gay. There's nothing wrong with it, dear. All sorts of people do it. They even get married. Well, not proper marriage, but it's all the same thing. I'm still not gay. I just thought, still not married, and the painting and the modeling. I've got girlfriends, Mommy. You've even met some of them. Nothing that ever struck, dear. I just thought that you might be something you wanted to tell me. I'm not gay, Mother. I would love to tell you if I was. And then I said, I snogged Tim Cater at a party when I was at art college, but we were drunk and it never went beyond that. She pursed her lips. That's quite enough of that, young man. I don't know why her voice is that, but we got it. <laughs> and then changed the subject as if to get rid of an unpleasant taste in her mouth. She said, you'll never guess who I bumped into at Tesco's last week. No, I won't. Who? Your old girlfriend. The first girlfriend, I should say. Nikki Blevins? Hang on, she's married, isn't she? Nikki Woodbridge? The one before, dear. Cassandra. I was behind her in line. I wonder, okay, is this actually just the girl in the photo and this is like a big awkward twist versus like a supernatural twist? Because awkward twists, pretty likely in life. I would have been ahead of her if I got that I needed cream from the berries today, so I went back to get it and as she was in front of me, I knew her face was familiar. At first, I thought she was Joni Simmons' youngest, uh, the one with the speech disorder. Well, well, we used to call her Stammer, but apparently you can't say that anymore. But then I thought, I know where I know that face from. It's, it was over your bed for five years, of course. I said, it's not Cassandra, is it? And she said, it is. And I said, you'll laugh when I say this, but I'm... St uh, this is the first time I actually heard the character's name. Stuart, oh, Stuart, that's the real name. Stuart Inns, this is mom. And she said, Stuart Inns, and her face lit up. Well, she hung around while I was putting my groceries in my shopping bag, and she said she'd already been in touch with your friend, Jeremy Porter on Bookface, and they'd been talking about you. You mean Facebook? She was talking to Scaly on Facebook? Yes, dear. 
I drank my tea and wondered who my mother had actually been talking to. I said, you're quite sure that that was Cassandra from over my bed? Oh, yes, dear. She told me about how you took her to Lister. L L L I still don't know that. Lister? Lister Square. And how sad she was when she had to move to Canada. Okay, this is supernatural. This is supernatural now. Supernatural. Side note, the only other character I know to ever move to Canada was the girl in Shenmue. She went to Canada. And then Ryu had to move boxes at the pier for the rest of the game. <laughs> they went to Vancouver. I asked her if she'd ever met my cousin, Leslie. He went to Vancouver, because, you know... Everyone, you just meet everyone in Vancouver after the war. But she said she didn't believe so, and it turns out that it's actually a big sort of a place. I told her about the pencil drawing you did, and she seemed very up to date on your activities. She was thrilled when I told her that you were having a gallery opening this week. You told her that? Yes, dear. I thought she'd like to know. Then my mother said, almost wistfully, She's very pretty, dear. I think she's doing something in community theater. Then the conversation, I'm back, my voice, went over to the retirement of Dr. Dunnins, who had been our GP since before I was born, and how he was the only non-Indian doctor left in the practice, and how my mother felt about this. I lay in bed that night in my small bedroom at my mother's house, and turned over the conversation in my head. I am no longer on Facebook, and thought about rejoining to see who Scaly's friends were. And if this pseudo-Cassandra was one of them. But there were too many people I was happy not to see again. And I let it be certain that when there was an explanation, it would prove to be a simple one. And I slept. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Man, this might be the last one, because we're already at uh, something 40 o'clock. 8.46. Yeah. I wonder if I've actually read this one already, because this, this does ring familiar. Parts of it, anyway. I have been showing in the little gallery in Chelsea for over a decade now. In the old days, I had a quarter of a wall and nothing priced at more than 300 pounds. Now I get my own show every October for a month. And it would be fair to say that I only have to sell a dozen paintings and know that my needs, rent, and life are covered for another year. Damn, that's a good deal. Want that. The unsold paintings remain on the gallery walls until they're gone, and they're always gone by Christmas. The couple on the gallery, Paul and Barry, still call me the beautiful boy, as they did twelve years ago, and I first exhibited with them when I might actually have been true. Back then, they wore flowery open neck shirts and gold chains. Now, in middle age, they wear expensive suits and talk too much for my liking about the stock exchange. Still, I enjoy the company. I see them three times a year in September when they come to my studio to see what I've been working on and select the paintings for the show at the gallery, hang in the opening in October and in February when we settle up. Barry runs the gallery. Paul Cohn owns it. Comes out for the parties, but also works in the wardrobe department at the Royal Opera House. The preview party for this year's show was on a Friday evening. I'd spent a nervous couple of days hanging the paintings. Now my part was done, and there was nothing for me to do but wait and hope people liked my art, and not to make a fool of myself. I did as I had done for the previous twelve years, on Barry's instructions, nursed the champagne. I, was going, I thought it was charm, but they split it again between pages. Champagne, fill up on water. There's nothing worse than a collector than encountering a drunken artist unless he's famous for being drunk, and you are not, dear. Shoot. This is a character's voice. I missed out on an opportunity. Well, they might come back again. Um, I'm trying to think of a voice. Should it be normal or silly? Maybe up there. Be amiable, but enigmatic. And when people ask for a story behind the painting, say, my lips are sealed. But for God's sake, imply that there is one. It's the story they're buying. I rarely invite people to the preview any longer. Some artists do regarding it's a social event. I do not. While I take my art seriously as art, I am proud of my work. The latest exhibition was called People and Landscapes, which pretty much says it all about my work anyway. 
I understand that the party exists solely as a commercial event to come on for eventual buyers, and then who might say the right thing to the, uh, the other eventual buyers? I tell you this so you will no longer be surprised that Barry and Paul manage the guest list to the preview, not I. The preview always begins at 6.30 p.m. I had spent the afternoon hanging paintings, making sure everything looked as good as it could, as I had just done every other year. The only thing that was different about the day in this particular event was how excited Paul looked, like a small boy struggling with the urge to tell you what he had bought for your birthday present. That and Barry, who said while they were hanging... Okay, was the last guy Barry or Paul? Barry runs the thing. I just want to make sure I'm not... What does Barry say? Barry's instructions, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so Barry was that voice. The only thing is, and then Barry, who said, while we were hanging, I think tonight's show, I forgot his voice, will be put on you on the map. <laughs> oh, man. This season is supernatural. Is there, like, some side chat going on in the chat that I don't understand? This season is supernatural. Is this supernatural? Oh. Oh, wait. Okay, yes. Pun... I said supernatural. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. I've got so many voices in my head I'm trying to parse. I said I think there's a typo on the Lake District one. An oversized painting of Windermere at sunset with two children staring lostly at the view from the banks. I should say 3,000 pounds. I say 300,000. Wait. Oh, yeah. This was... Does it? Said Barry blandly. My, my. I didn't have a raspy voice. Oh, whatever. But he did nothing to change it. It was perplexing, but the first guest had arrived a little early and the mystery could wait. A young man invited me to eat a mushroom puff from a silver tray. I took my glass of nurse this slowly of champagne from the table on the corner and I prepared to mingle. All the prices were high and I doubted that the little gallery would be able to sell the paintings at those prices and I worried about the year ahead. Barry and Paul always take responsibility for moving me around the room, saying, This is the artist, that beautiful boy who makes all the painting things, beautiful things. Stuart In Innes. Innes? I-N-N-E-S is Innes, isn't it? Or is it Innes? Innes. Uh, and I shake hands and smile. By the end of the evening, I'll have met every and Paul, everyone, and Paul and Barry are very good about saying, Stuart, you remember David? He writes about art for the telegraph. And I, for my part, am good about saying, Of course! How are you? So glad you could come. The room was at its most crowded when a striking redhead woman, to whom I had not been introduced, began shouting, Oh, man. Oh, re re <laughs> I don't want to go into Muppet territory. Repres <laughs> she's angry, so this is the first thing she'll ever say. Representational, representational bullshit is what she said. Representational bullshit! I was in conversation with the Daily Telegraph art critic when we turned. He said, Uh, friend of yours, I am a telegraph. She was still shouting, although the sound at the party had now quieted. She shouted, Nobody interested in this art. Nobody's. Nobody. <laughs> then she reached her hand into her coat pocket and pulled out a bottle of ink, shouted, Try selling this now! And threw ink at Windermere Sunset. It was blue black ink. Paul was by her side then, pulling the ink bottle away from her, saying, Oh, I don't have a voice for Paul yet. Oh, that, that was a 300,000 pound painting, young lady. Barry took her arm, said, I think the police will want a word with you, and walked her back to his office. Hmm, I'm suspicious about this interaction. She shouted at us as she went, I'm not afraid, I'm proud. Artists like him just feeding off the gullible art buyers. You're all sheep. Representational crap. And then she was gone. And the party people were buzzing. The inspected, they inspected the ink-fouled painting and looked at me. And the telegraph man was asking if I would like to comment on how I felt about seeing a 300,000 pound painting destroyed. And I mumbled about how I was proud to be a painter and said something about the transient nature of art. And he said he was surprised that tonight's event was an artistic happening in his own right. And we agreed that, artistic happening or not, the woman was not quite right in the head. Barry repeat, uh, reappeared, moving from group to group, explaining that Paul was dealing with the young lady and that her eventual disposition would be up to me. The guests were still buzzing excitedly as he ushered them out the door. Barry apologized as he did so, agreed that we lived in exciting times, explained that he would have opened at the, will open at a regular time tomorrow. 
Uh, shoot, Barry. That went well, he said when we went alone in the gallery. Well, that was a disaster. Mmm, Stuart Inns, the one who had the 300,000 pound painting destroyed. I think you need to be forgiving, don't you? She was a fellow artist, even one in the different goals. Sometimes you need a little something to kick up you to the next level. We went into the back room. I said, whose idea was this? Oh, shoot. What was Paul's voice again? Er, no. That was the telegraph. Paul. 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 Shoot. Too many voices. I haven't plotted this out. Ours, said Paul. He was drinking white wine in the back room with a red-headed woman. Well, berries mostly. But I needed a good little actress to pull it off, and I found her. <laughs> she grinned modestly. Managed, oh, what, my manners, I gotta get my voice back. Managed to look both abashed and pleased with herself. Uh, if this doesn't get you the attention you deserve, beautiful boy, said Barry, smiling at me, nothing will. Now, you're important enough to be attacked. The Windermere painting's ruined. I pointed out. Barry glanced at Paul, and they giggled. Uh, Barry, wait, Paul, Barry, wait, Paul. Which one is which voice? Oh, God, Barry. It's already sold, ink splattered and all, for 7,500 pounds, Barry said. It's like I always say. People think that you're buying the art, but really, they're buying the story. Paul filled her glasses. And we owe it all to you, he said to a woman. Stuart, Barry, I'd like to propose a toast to Cassandra. Cassandra, we repeated, and we drank. This time I did not nurse my drink. I needed it. Then, as the name was still sinking in, Paul said, Cassandra, this ridiculously attractive and talented young man is, as I'm sure you know, Stuart ends. Huh. I know, she said. Actually, we're very old friends. No, not that old. <laughs> I want. I was going for mystery, and then I went into like old wizard. We're very, we're very, very. Okay, we could do that. Old friends. Do tell, <laughs> said Barry. Well, said Cassandra. Twenty years ago, Stuart wrote my name in his maths exercise notebook okay when they said exercise books i thought it was like you know getting swole books but they meant math get your brain swole read your exercise books i guess whatever uh i th she looked like ah it's me again she looked like the girl in my drawing yes or like the girl in the photograph all grown up sharp-faced intelligent assured i never seen a bird before in a day of my life Hello, Cassandra, I said. I couldn't think of anything else to say. Okay. 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 Mysteries. Oh, man, it's 8.58. Uh, okay, there's only like three or four more pages, so we can wrap this one up. But this will be the end of Trigger Warning, so... Enjoy it while it lasts, and go buy a copy if you want the rest. Yum, 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 yum. Okay. We were in the wine bar beneath my flat. They serve food there, too. It's more than just a wine bar. I found myself talking to her as if she was someone I had known since childhood. And I reminded myself she wasn't. I'd only met her that evening. She still had ink stains on her hands. We had glanced at the menu, ordered the same thing, the vegetable or de vegetarian mez. And when I had arrived, both started at the dolmeds. With the dolmaids. Then moved on to the hummus. You don't know what dolmaids are? Dolmaids. Read fast. Oh god, here we go. Speed run, kids. Time to blast through this. It was not the first thing I had said. Wait, shit. Okay, here we go. First we had talked about her community theater. How she has become friends with Paul. And offered to her a thousand pounds for the evening show. And how she had needed the money. But mostly said to him. Because it sounded like a fun adventure. Anyway, she said. She shouldn't say no. When she heard my name mentioned. She thought it was fight. 
That was when I said it. I was scared she would think I was mad. Uh, I said it. I made you up. No, you didn't. No, I'm not an old man. <clears throat> no, you did. No, no, she said. You didn't. I mean, obviously you didn't. I'm really here. Th there, she said. Would you like to touch me? Oh, jeez. I make a snarky comment at this point, but I can't even think right now. I'm reading too fast. I looked at her. Her face was the posture in her eyes. She's everything I'd ever dreamed of in a woman. Everything I'd ever miss in a woman. Yes, I said very much. <laughs> Let's eat a dinner first, she said. She said, she said, I said it, I don't know. Then she said, how long has it been since you were with a woman? No, she said that, how long has it been since you were with a woman? And I protested, I have a girlfriend. And she said, I don't know, what's the last one? I tried to remember, what's British? Was a stylist in the agency? Well, calm down for half a second. Two years, I said, perhaps three. I just haven't met the right person yet. Uh, you did once, she said. She opened her handbag then. Wait, that's me narrating it. A big floppy purple thing. Pulled out of the cardboard folder, then it removed a piece of paper, taped beneath the corners. See? I remember it. How could I not? It had hung above my bed for years. She was looking around as if talking to someone beyond the curtain. Cassandra, it said, February 19th, 1985. Side note, I was born that year. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. As a sign, Stuart ends. There was something at the same time embarrassing and heartwarming about seeing your handwriting from when you were 15. Okay, we can do this. Rose, this is just one page. What am I doing? I came back from Canada in 89. She said my parents' marriage fell apart after out there in Canada. Canada does that to marriages. I don't know. Then mom wanted to come home. I wondered about you, uh, what you were doing, and I went to your old address. The house was empty. Windows were broken, and it was obvious nobody lived there anymore. They knocked down the riding stable already. They made me so mad. I loved horses as a girl, obviously, but I walked through the house until I found your bedroom. It was obviously your bedroom, although it was the furniture was gone. It smelled like you, and I was still pinned to the wall. I didn't think think anyone would miss it she smiled who are you cassandra krillis age 34 former actress failed playwright now running a company theater in norwood drama therapy hall for rent four years four plays a year plus workshops and a local pantro who are you Stuart? you know who i am then you know i never met you before don't you she nodded ah she said poor Stuart." You live just above here, don't you? Yes, it's a bit loud sometimes, but it's hard, handy for the tube, and the rent isn't painful. Let's pay the bill and go upstairs. I reached out to touch the back of her hand. Not yet, she said, moving her hand away before I could touch her. We should talk first. She went upstairs. I like your flat, she said. I like exactly. Wait, let's do that again. It looks exactly like the kind of place I imagine you being. Imagine you're being, that's, that's the word, sentence, okay. It's probably time to start thinking about getting something a bit bigger, I told her. But it, do, it does me fine. There's, there's, good, there's good light out of the back of my studio. You can't get that effect out at night, but it's great for painting. Okay, take a couple breaths. Okay, we can do this. We can do this. It's strange bringing someone home. It makes you see the place as you live as if you've not been there before. There are two oil paintings of me in the lounge for my short-lived career as an artist. Model, I did not have the patience to stand for a pose for very long. A failing, I know. A blown-up advertisement photo of me and a little kitten. The, and, and the loo. Of course, book covers with me on it, romance covers mostly, over the stairs. I showed her the studio, and then the bedroom. She exclaimed that Edwardian Barber's chair and I were res rescued from the ancient place. That closed down in Shoreditch. As you may know, all British locations trip me up. <laughs> she sat down on the chair, pulled off her shoes. Ah, okay, we got this. Who was the first grown-up you liked? She asked. Odd question. My mother, I suppose. Don't know why. Don't know why. Two separate thoughts. I was three, perhaps four. He was a postman called Mr. Posty. He'd come to his little post van to bring me lovely things, not every day, just sometimes, brown paper packages with my name on it, and inside there'd be toys or sweets or something. He had a funny, friendly face with a knobbly nose, and he was real. He sounded like someone a kid would make up. He drove a post van inside, inside the house. It wasn't very big. She began to unbutton her blouse. It was cream-colored, still flecked with splatters of ink. What's the first thing you actually remember, not something you were told or did? That you really remember. Going to the seaside when I was three with my mom and my dad. Do you remember it? Or do you remember being told about it? I don't see what the point of this is. She stood up, wiggled, stepped out of her skirt. She wore a white bra, dark green panties, beret, 
very human, not something you would wear to impress a new lover. I wondered what her breasts would look like. I'm mature, I could do this. When the bra came off, I wanted to stroke them to touch them with my lips. She walked from the chair to the bed where I was sitting. Lie down now on the side of the bed. I'll be next to you. Don't touch me. I laid down, my hands on my sides. She looked down at me. She said, You're so beautiful. I'm not honestly sure whether you're my type. You would have been if I was 15, though. Nice and sweet and unthreatening. Artistic. Ponies. A riding stable. And I bet you never make a move on a girl unless you're sure she's ready, do you? The story started in, like, Amsterdam, didn't it? Anyway. No, I said. As this we come so far, I feel like. Such a journey. I don't suppose that I do. She lay down beside me. You can touch me now, said Cassandra. How far are we? Oh, man. All right, brace yourselves. Last two pages and a half. I had started thinking about Stuart again last night. Last... Oh. Ooh. Wait. Oh, if I think what happened, my voice might ruin this. I, was start I started thinking about Stuart again last year. Stress, I think. Work was going well up to this point. I had broken up with Pavel, who may or may not have been an actual bad hat, although he certainly had his fingers in many dodgy East European pies, and I was thinking about internet dating. I had spent a stupid week joining the kind of website that links you to old friends, and from there it was no distance to Jeremy Scaly Porter and to Stuart Inns. Twist? I don't think I could do it anymore. I lacked the single mind in this. The attention to detail, something else you lose when you get older. Mr. Potsy used to come in his van, and my parents had no time for me. He would smile, his big, gnomey smile, wink an eye at me, hand me a brown paper parcel with Cassandra written on it in big block letters, and inside would be a chocolate or a doll or a book. His final present was a pink plastic microphone, and I would walk around the house singing into it, pretending to be on TV. It was the best present I'd ever been given. My parents did not ask about the gifts. I did not wonder who was actually sending them. They came from Mr. Posty, who drove his little van down the hall and up my bedroom door and always knocked three times. I was a demonstrative girl, and the next time I saw him, after the plastic microphone, I ran to him and threw my arms around his legs. It's hard to describe what happened then. He fell like snow or like ash. For a moment I had been holding someone, then there were just powdery white stuff and nothing. I used to wish that Mr. Posty could come back after that, but he never did. He was over. After a while, he became embarrassing to remember I had fallen for that. It's so strange, this room. I wonder why I could ever have thought that somebody who made me happy when I was 15 would make me happy now. But Stuart was perfect. The riding stable with ponies. The painting which showed me as, he'd, as he was sensitive. And the inexperience with girls so I could be his first. And how very, very tall, dark, and handsome he would be. I liked the name, too. It was vaguely Scottish and, to my mind, sounded like the hero of a novel. I wrote Stuart's name in my exercise books. <laughs> I did not tell my friends the most important thing about Stuart. That I had made him up. Oh, what's going on? And now I'm getting up off my bed and looking down at the outline of a man, a silhouette in flower, flower or ash or dust on the black satin bread spread. Bed spread, not a bread spread. That's a different thing. And I'm getting into my clothes. The photographs on the wall are fading, too. I didn't expect that. I wonder what will be left of his world in a few hours. Wonder if I should have left well enough alone. A masturbatory fantasy, some things reassuring and comforting. He would have gone through his life without ever really touching anyone, just a picture and a painting and a half-memory for a handful of people who barely ever thought of him anymore. I leave the flat. There are still people at the wine bar downstairs. They are sitting at the table in the corner where Stuart and I had been sitting earlier. The candle had burned way down, but I imagined that it would almost that it could almost be us, a man and a woman in conversation. And soon enough, they will get up from their table and walk away, and the candle will be snuffed and the lights turned out, and that will be it for the night. I held a taxi, climbed in. For a moment, for I hope the last time, I find myself missing Stuart Inns. Then I sit back in the seat of the taxi and I let him go. I hope I can afford the taxi fare and find myself wondering whether this will be a check in my bag or in the morning or just another blank sheet of paper. Then more satisfied than note, not. I close my eyes and I wait to go home. Huh. Hmm 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 hmm. Ha ha. 
The Thing About Cassandra. That is the third story in the collection by Neil Gaiman. Trigger warning. Uh, interesting one. I don't know if we want to like dissect it to be like, was Stuart imaginary all along? Did she make up the story? But hey, is that not what stories are for? Us to dissect and have book clubs about? Maybe. But anyway, that is the end of Trigger Warnings. Uh, and I think, technically, this is also the end of me reading British books, because I don't think I have anything else on my shelf uh, outside of these. So uh, next week for Shaggy Reads Live, I do, uh, again, kind of like last time, how I did something different and tried to translate a comic, a Japanese uh, a manga about a dude eating things and tried to translate it based on just the visuals alone uh, i want to try something a little fun and different next week for the end of the month for the end of shaggy reads live february uh and then for march we actually have an extra special treat um that we're going to be doing i won't tell you just yet because i want to keep you guys intrigued and stuck in my web of literature reading poorly you know as i do anyway thanks for checking out shaggy reads live uh if you're in the toronto area i'm just gonna throw out a quick promotion last night i went to the uh show uh the live performance by sex t-rex called crime after crime after crime if you uh haven't seen enough live theater or have seen enough and are like push what more can the theater do to surprise me please do go see crime after crime 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 after crime after crime uh by sex t-rex these guys uh it is one they are one of the funnest uh, you know, improv troops plus just uh, theater and uh, this is a scripted show. There's probably like a couple of improv gags in here and there, but it's a scripted show. Uh, it is phenomenal. Please do go. It's also a speakeasy, so uh, please do like dress up in like uh, some era clothing, be like the '50s, the '70s, or the '90s, and have some fun. Uh, I went last night on the opening night. It was phenomenal. It goes until Sunday, uh, and it's up in like Dupont and Ossington area, Dupont and Dufferin. Uh, definitely worth checking out. Uh, bring your friends. Get your tickets at uh, brown, brown paper bag. Brown brown paper bag is where you buy them, but go to sextrex.com or whatever their website is, uh, and check it out. Totally worth your time, and it may open up. Uh, if you haven't done any live theater, uh, attended any live shows, this is a great place to start. Uh, they are very fun to see. So that's my my shout out for the week. Thanks for joining me on Shaggy Reads Live this February evening, and I'll see you guys next week. So I'm gonna hold off on hitting the stop button because I'm never certain. If it like cuts out the feed, so I'm just gonna do this for 10 seconds. One. Yeah, it's by Neil Gaiman, so there you go. He's a good writer.